Good evening, everybody. We're just so incredibly grateful that you're taking time out of your lives tonight to be with us for our 1619 Project Rally. And so on behalf of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts, our National Urban League, and all of the 40 organizations that are engaged in the 1619 Project, welcome. We're so proud as the Urban League to be the lead organizer for the 1619 Project. My name is Keith Motley. I am honored to be the consultant to the Urban League here in Eastern Massachusetts. I also want to give a shout out to my colleague and brother and friend, um, Henry Thomas, who is the CEO of our Urban League in Springfield. So I just wanted you to know tonight that we connect across the Commonwealth as an Urban League, and we're excited about that. Just like we're connecting across the Commonwealth to vote and also to protect our polls tomorrow. And so this is a coalition that William Watkins, who was on this call tonight, and you're going to hear from later, um, helped organize to make sure that we, as organizations, could pull together around 400 volunteers to cover all the polls in Boston. That's 255. In Brockton, that's 21. And in Randolph, that's seven polls. Now, we've been fortunate enough to be able to utilize, to train all of us, the expertise of mass vote and also the lawyers for civil rights um, for our field operations, for managing our statewide hotline, and from watching social media threats. So tonight is a way for us to get you bumped up, but also to say thank you. Thank you for volunteering to protect the polls and to express the importance of this moment in our history and the vital role you're going to play tomorrow in making history. Together with your support, we will have these polls protected and people will be able to vote. So tonight, I've invited a few of my friends to be here with you. We have a stellar lineup. It's going to include Joseph Feaster Jr., the board chair of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts, National Urban League President Mark Mariel. I know some of you are saying you just had him for lunch the other day. Well, he's back tonight on the night before the election to be here with us for this event. We have our incredible Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who we just had last week for Leaders Over Lunch, and we're so grateful to have her. We have our mayor, the mayor of the great city of Boston, working hard every day. Our mayor, Marty Walsh, is here with us tonight. We have our DA, Rachel Rollins, here tonight, ready to pump you up. You're going to see her on Leaders Over Lunch soon. And we're going to have our incredible president of our city council, Kim Janey, here tonight. And of course, we couldn't have done this without Mass Vote and the incredible Cheryl Clyburn and Crawford, or nor could we have done it without the great Sophia Hall, who trained us and got us ready on the, and, and made sure that we don't make any challenges our own and own them tomorrow. So thank you so much, Sophia, for that. And of course, we're going to close with William Watkins, who's going to tell us all what we need to do to be prepared for tomorrow. So we're going to start this rally out and get, and get this spirit going by starting with the Urban League um, chairman of the board, Joseph Feaster. He is the uh, president of Feaster Enterprises, a strategic planning, organizational development, and community outreach consulting firm. He's been a board member of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law. He's a board member of the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health, but he's also our chair, and we're, he's also been president of the Boston branch of the NAACP. NAACP plays a big role in tonight, and so we're so grateful. Uh, Chairman Feaster to have you. Why don't you get us going for the night? Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
I was going to say Chancellor Motley because you are our chancellor, but I am going to say Dr. Motley for it. And thank you for all of the panelists on here this evening. I'm so happy to see all of you. I particularly want to uh, underscore what Dr. Motley said about uh, William Watkins and all the organizations that have put this together. Sophia, with the Lawyers Committee, you know, I was a co-chair with the local Lawyers Committee for, for many, many years. Uh, and so just to see all of our, uh, as, as our Congresswoman would say, our heroes and our sheroes uh, on this particular time with us here today. I'm, I'm going to hold my predictions for the election in terms of until at the end of it, but I primarily want to be able to say the important issue that we want to bring to bear this evening is that to all who are, who are viewing this and participating, we have to get out and get out to vote in a strong way. I am so happy to see that this coalition has come together uh, because in years past when it wasn't, uh, wasn't the virus, I would be out there doing poll watching and trying to do some of the poll checking for candidates um, in past times. Well, we have that effort going on at the present time, and what's anticipated is that there may be some problems at the polls. There may be challenges, that are un unscrupulous things that are going to happen, and I'm glad that Sophia Hall has put right. on, along with the coalition has been able to put together the people to do that. So I will have an opportunity to say more later. I just want to say thank you to the all to all of you who are participating as panelists. And I see that our illustrious national chairman is here. So I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Motley, to introduce our national chairman of the Urban League, Mark Morial. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Feaster. We're so grateful to have you um, in leadership here in Massachusetts in all that you do. But I'm just honored tonight to have back with us again. Just a few weeks ago, we had him here for Leaders Over Lunch. He's our National Urban League President. He served as the Mayor of New Orleans from 1994 to 2002. He's been the President of the United States Conference of Mayors. He's also um, has an incredible book out that you need to check out the Jumbo Coalition, the Gumbo Coalition, and get that Gumbo Coalition book. The mayor just hung it up for you to see. But also, we're so honored to have you tonight. We know that you had lots of choices and lots of places to be tonight, the night before this national election. Thank you so much, um, President Marial, for being here with us. Look, let me, uh, let me thank you again for your leadership and the chairman uh, for his leadership. Uh, both of you have been outstanding in, in really uh, leading the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts and uh, helping us move uh, aggressively into the future, and I want to thank you all for that. To all who have joined tonight, uh, I'm on pins and needles. <laughs> You're on pins and needles uh, as, we, as we await uh, the completion of voting and the process of counting to see who will lead this nation going into 2021. Uh, I do want to just offer a few a very, very important thoughts to those who are listening. Uh, number one, notwithstanding the fact that almost 100 million people have already cast our ballot, uh, their ballots, we must work until the last poll closes in the last state. What does that mean? If you have voted, you have to pester, bother, harass, cajole, arm twist, everybody amongst your fam and friends, family and friends, uh, your entire network to make sure that they too have cast a ballot and will cast a ballot in this election. This is gonna be uh, each of us as a committee of one, trying to impact and influence everyone we see, everyone we meet, everyone who's in our network, our social media network, who comes within earshot. It's that important. Don't believe the hype of polling, which says this state is uh, one and this state is even and this state. No, this is about every vote counting and our voices uh, particularly the voices of black people being heard at the polls in a resounding way. That's number one. Number two, 
If you see, hear, learn, witness any intimidation, harassment, suppression, or irregularity, we want to ask you to call our 1-866-OUR-VOTE hotline. Now, perhaps in Massachusetts, there hasn't been as much of that type of activity, but I can tell you that in Texas, in Florida, in Georgia, in North Carolina, uh, there are uh, things occurring that are unsettling, that are inappropriate, and that are tantamount to suppression and intimidation. We don't want people to focus on anything other than the fact that we should not be intimidated, we should not be stopped, and that those in law enforcement, people in the community, law enforcement has an obligation, people in the community, we're going to do everything we can to protect your right to vote. But the 1-866-I-VOTE hotline will be taking calls throughout the day. Spread that number around for anyone that sees, hears, witnesses, any irregularity, intimidation, or harassment. That's number two. Number three, I'm asking everyone to join me in this simple message. We want to make sure every vote is counted. All of this talk about quote unquote, the vote should be all counted tomorrow. That vote, that's a distraction by you know who. Uh, that's a distraction that's designed to try to discredit the outcome of this election. Many people have voted early and by mail because of concerns about their health, trying to stay safe, trying to stay healthy. And they've used an option that is available, and we want to make sure every mail ballot, every absentee ballot, every early vote is absolutely, fully and completely counted. Very crucial and very important in connection with this. Now, we just want to reflect what's at stake. The presidency is obviously at stake. Control of the United States Senate is obviously at stake. I might add that uh, in the South, there are African-American candidates running in Mississippi, Mike Espy, uh, African-American candidate running in Georgia, Reverend Raphael Warnock, an African-American candidate running for the United States Senate in the great state of South Carolina, Jamie Harrison. Uh, Ma Massachusetts knows because you sent uh, one of only two African-Americans to serve in the Senate to Washington in the entire decade of the 20th century. And that was the late Ed Brooke, who was Attorney General of Massachusetts and later a United States Senator from 1966 uh, all the way through 1978. Uh, you know, but there's a chance now with three African-Americans on the ballot in the South, I might add, that an, an extra element and dynamic of history could potentially be at play uh, in tomorrow's uh, election. Uh, we uh, want to ask if you have relatives in Pennsylvania, family and friends in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin, Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Texas, Arizona, these states Please weigh in, please call, please text, please email, please Facebook, please uh, uh, send a Twitter message. Send a message. We want to fight all the way until the last poll is closed for every single vote. Uh, and look, if you encounter someone who says, I don't want to vote, I've been saying, you know, it's not about the individual. It's about history and it's about the future. And never has a race been more important to our children and grandchildren, our progeny, and those that come after us than this 2020 election because of the challenges we face, COVID, the economy, and racial justice. These issues are at play uh, in this very, very important uh, election. I might add, out in California, there are propositions on the ballot uh, one important proposition would reverse California's ban on affirmative action. Uh, we are supporting that with three Urban League affiliates 
and a large coalition in the state of California. So everyone is working hard. Our Reclaim Your Vote campaign, Urban League has have made to touch some 1 million people in this cycle by phone and text and contactless tracing uh, in touching people in states and cities all across America through our Reclaim Your Vote campaign, which is a partnership with BET and a number of others. So I want to thank all of you out there who in any way, shape, or form have participated in this effort, have made this effort one we could be extremely proud of uh, and quite strong. Uh, there is work to do. Uh, you know what the work is, and uh, I appreciate everything that each of you is doing. Nothing is more important than us sending a strong message. My goal is a record turnout, and especially a record African-American turnout in every city, every state, uh, every county, in the urban, suburban, and rural areas. African-Americans live in urban areas. African American live African Americans live in suburban areas. African Americans live in rural areas. Uh, we can make a difference uh, across the board. So we know what our work is. Uh, we know we're standing on great shoulders. We know we're planning for the future. So I want to thank you all for what you, you you're doing, and uh, long live the, the good work of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts uh, and your leadership and that of the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, President Morial, I can see why you have the book, The Gumbo, because you have certainly set the table for this conversation uh, today and for what we need to do across this great land. Um, you know, uh, we Christians on, the, on here uh, have certain parables in the Bible that we hope will come to play. I'm an Old Testament Christian, so I'm going to come to play in this. And I may talk about that a little bit later on. But I have the distinct honor to introduce a person who is a dear family member, as she made me uh, 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 underscore the other day when I made a slip of the tongue and said a friend. This is a person I've known from when she first worked with uh, Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy. But now she has jumped into the political spectrum in a mighty, mighty way, not only having served uh, as an at-large member of the Boston City Council in 2010, was the first black woman elected to the Boston City Council, and now the first black woman elected to Congress. She is a, none other than the person who represents the seventh district, which includes the northern three quarters of Boston, most of Cambridge, parts of Milton, as well as Chelsea, Everett, Randolph, and Somerville. For, for your purposes, Mr. President Morial, uh, those are that is Boston and its and its environs. She has most of the health centers that exist in her district. She has been an extraordinary leader, an extraordinary spokesperson for Massachusetts. That's none other than our Congresswoman, Ayanna Presley. Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, family. Uh, thank you, Dr. Modley. Thank you uh, to President Morial. Thank you to our mayor and to DA Rollins. Um, grateful for both your leadership and your partnership uh, in every endeavor. And I appreciate the opportunity to sit at this virtual table with all of you at this moment. Um, President Morial, um, you know, Joe was talking about the Massachusetts seventh, the district I represent. It is a diverse, dynamic and vibrant district. Uh, it is also one of the most unequal in the country. And that was true uh, before four years ago but those inequities and disparities and certainly racial uh, injustices across every outcome have only been exacerbated in the last four years when it seems like we've been drinking from a fire hose. And so the vote in this moment, I see it as the resistance. I see it as the affirmation. Reverend Barber, who is someone that I look to as a spiritual guide and compass often, says this national reckoning will demand of us a reconstruction, a third reconstruction. So all of you that are participating at this virtual table today, every day in community, I know if you're here, the intention you arrived at this, you are already community builders. You are already movement leaders. You are already caretakers. You know, so now I'm asking you to be community builders for this third reconstruction to build that more equitable and just society because we cannot return to a pre-COVID normal that was insufficient, unjust, and inadequate to begin with. 
And so that community building for the third reconstruction begins with the casting of our ballots. You know, power is not something that is uh, finite. It is infinite. It exists within all of us. So I want to thank all of you for your contributions, for your sweat equity, your work to organize the folks that really only you can reach. There's someone that for each of us, only we can reach them. And because of you, we're going to turn the page on a dark chapter in history, and we can usher in a new era. Our community is powerful. Our vote is powerful. And so each of you is showing up here today. Your actions are a testament to your commitment to doing the shared work of building that more just world. And so far as I see it, we are living in the midst of the civil rights movement right now. I know that folks like the history will sanitize it and make it a digestible soundbite, and they'll have you convinced that Rosa sat and, you know, Martin March and John crossed the bridge, and then suddenly black folks had full liberation and emancipation. And that is not true. We are still in the civil rights movement. You know that we're still in the midst of that because the continued struggle for decent jobs, human rights, and a nation that values the lives of every person, we are still in pursuit of that. So the civil rights movement isn't these grainy black and white images uh, that we see on, uh, in documentaries. It wasn't even that long ago, first of all, but it is this moment. It is this moment. Every day we are fighting for our shared humanity and dignity. The civil rights movement is far from over. Wouldn't it be incredible to have folks at every level of government who are accountable to the American people, who are true partners, who choose hope over fear? Someone who will prioritize our babies, not bank accounts. So I know that if you're here, you might feel like we already know all of this. Why are you preaching to the choir? Well, I do that because I need you to sing. I need you to sing and make clear the stakes of this election. This is not just the most consequential election in our lifetime. It is the most consequential election in our nation's history. And although we put great emphasis on the top of the ticket, and I appreciate President Morial talking about those opportunities in the South, in the Senate, to regain control of the Senate, it's also down ballot races. Your state senator, your state representative, these are the people that are going to be looking over that census data that you work so hard to get an accurate count for to determine political representation, which will determine the federal resources that are invested in our community. So all these things are interconnected. So I need you to sing, choir. I need you to dig deep. I need you to work your hearts out in these final 24 hours and ensure that your friends, your family, those you worship with, your coworkers, all vote. Now I'll end with this. The Birmingham movement was 37 days. The Freedom Rides was seven months. The Greensboro sit-ins were five months and the Montgomery bus boycott was 381 days. If those justice seekers, if those foot soldiers can make the innumerable personal sacrifices they did, put their bodies on the line for those many hours, days, weeks, and months, then we can do what we must in the next 24 hours. This is an unprecedented moment that demands of us unprecedented organizing, mobilizing, and voting so that we can usher in an unprecedented era of healing. Yesterday's water hoses are today's long lines. Yesterday's attack dogs manifest as arson in our drop boxes. Yesterday's Klan are today's white supremacists. So you are standing in history, in the gap in this moment. You are the continuation of the movement. You are writing the next chapter of this nation's history. And another world is possible. And we can make it happen together. So I thank you all for the invitation to join you. I'm looking forward to building this new world. And it begins tomorrow. Amen, amen, amen. So we're getting fired up here. Thank you to all of the uh, speakers we've had so far, but we're just getting started. And so <clears throat> it's my honor to welcome um, our 54th mayor of the city of Boston, Mayor Marty Walsh, but also someone who gets it, someone who served this community as a member of the House of Representatives, and someone who has a passionate love for this city. Uh, Mayor Walsh, welcome. Thank you. We're grateful that you're here tonight. We have 255 polls in the city of Boston to make sure that we're out and being a part of tomorrow, and we're going to be out there helping as much as we can. 
Uh, welcome, Mayor Walsh. Thank you, President Motley, and I want to appreciate you setting the agenda that I followed uh, the Congresswoman to the microphone, so I really am grateful for that. So. Well, you said you love to sing, so we got you singing tonight. Just, uh, singing. That won't be good. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll hang out. It's wonderful so, to be with you. Let me thank you. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. All right. Thank so, you. Mr. Mayor, I will miss it's all right, Congresswoman, you, you keep fighting, and I want to thank the Congresswoman for her great work that she's doing all across this country uh, in this election and over the last bunch of years, so thank you. Thank you for your work. I know you got to jump. There's other things. you got to get to other calls. I appreciate that. Uh, President Motley, um, Chairman Fisa, thank you very much as well for your friendship. Uh, District Attorney Rawlings, uh, for, your, for your leadership here in the city of Boston. Um, Sophia Hall, thank you for all that you're doing tomorrow to make sure that that voting is safe for everybody. I appreciate it uh, from the bottom of my heart. Um, to, to, to President Thomas, your friendship and leadership as well. Um, to, to, to Cheryl and, and you know, you know what you're doing with the vote and, and really pushing it out, thank you. And to the President of Boston City Council, President Cheney, thank you for your leadership and friendship as well. We were on a call earlier today uh, talking about how do we move forward here. And to uh, President Morial, who's a friend, uh, former mayor, and it's great to see you. I know we had to jump, I think, for another call. Um, to everyone at the 1619 Project, um, all the organizations, thank you for what you do. The volunteers who have done amazing work as well. Um, it, you know, Ayanna talked about this. This is a historic election for many reasons. Uh, we have to make sure that everyone's voice is heard through voting. It's the foundation of our democracy. It's also a crucial pillar of racial and social justice. Uh, the Urban League has been a champion of this work for decades, and I want to thank all of you for who are on here today. Um, voter intimidation, we're not going to stand for it here in Boston and Massachusetts, but certainly voter suppression and threats of voter intimidation is happening all across this world, all across this country, uh, which is really sad, and it's happening every day, and we're, gonna, we're not going to let that rear its ugly head here in Boston. Uh, in, in recent years, we've been working hard to, to make voting easy and accessible and convenient uh, to all. And I just want to give a couple quick numbers here, and I won't be long here, but in Boston, 55,716 people have casted their vote already, early vote. They've gone to an early vote location. Uh, as of yesterday, 103,268 Bostonians have submitted their mail-in ballots. Uh, we have a total of 159,000 Bostonians have already voted. That's 36.5% 36 of the turnout uh, before Election Day by comparison to what happened in six, 2016, 66.75% of all people voted. Um, we're expecting a significant turnout tomorrow. Uh, to all the volunteers on the call tonight, uh, you've made a real difference. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for what you've done. Uh, these numbers are a testament to the hard work of the many volunteers and organizations, including the 1619 Project. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to. I'm not going to go too long, but this last three and a half years has been difficult in our country. Um, four years ago, when um, election night came, and uh, I couldn't believe when I watched Wisconsin come in, uh, when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States of America, and I, I thought to myself, how can this be the case? Uh, and, and the next day, I was in my office, in the mayor's office, and, and next to my office is called the Eagle Room. And I brought down uh, all the young people that worked in neighborhood services and, and they were crying and upset and devastated uh, because they had worked so hard for Hillary Clinton. We had gone up to New Hampshire for five or six straight weekends and we had done so much work. I, I, and I said to them, we have two opportunities, two options. One is to bury our head under a pillow uh, and, and pray that the next four years go by fast or, or, or we rise up and, and support people. And I'm proud to say that my office and many of you on this call did that. Uh, the first attack was the women's march that we had. Um, Trump criticizing and attacking women's rights, and we, we expected 75,000 people show up at Boston Common, 175,000 people, women showed up at Boston Common, uh, fighting to support immigrant rights and Muslim rights and people of color's rights, LGBTQ rights, the rights of, of all the things that people have fought for for so long, not just to not just to have, but to build on. And for the last three and a half years, this this White House has just completely torn down uh, everything that that we believe in. And, and President Muriel talked about it, about the importance of, of not just this election at the top of the ticket, and, and Congresswoman Presley did as well, but the election of all throughout um, the legislative fights across the country. And, and my only ask for all of you tonight is, is simple, is before you put your head on your pillow tonight, I want you to take out your cell phone, and I want you to scroll through the phone, and I want to look and you find your friends that live in Georgia and your friends that live in Arizona, and your friends that live in North Carolina, and your friends that live in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Ohio, and Iowa, 
all across the country, up in New Hampshire and up in Maine, to let them know the importance of this election, what's at stake. We still have 24 hours to make a difference. We have 24 hours to make a difference. And it's so important that, that we don't, tomorrow night at 8, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whenever it comes in, whenever the final results come in, this country, uh, Vice President Biden talks about fighting for the soul of our nation. We are fighting for the soul of our nation. This nation has lots of work to do. We have a lot of work, unfinished business that has not been done from the civil rights movement to every other important moment in history in our country. So I'm asking you all to make sure that we take that opportunity to go out there and do everything we can to make sure that tomorrow night we're happy. The last thing I want to say to Urban League, thank you for your incredible leadership here in the city of Boston. Thank you for your incredible dedication and commitment in the, in the city of Boston. And everyone, let's go out and kick some butt tomorrow. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is, as you have said, as Congresswoman Presley has said, as President Mariel has said, this is a call to action, folks. This isn't a matter of just talking heads, just uh, having a good time chatting with you, the panel on here. We're here to get you ginned up, get you activated, get you involved, get you to make those calls to those battleground states to make sure that we get folks out and to get that biblical message now, you know, I don't want to talk about, I keep talking about this biblical thing, but I'm just going to say it for a quick moment. And then I want to introduce our next speaker. And that is in terms of I'm a believer in what happened when, when, when God sent the plague uh, to the Pharaoh and what happened at that particular point in time. And we, and I see some, uh, some metaphor here in terms of the plague. And I hope that the results are the same, that we'll part the Red Sea, we'll get to the other side and have our victory. So I'm, a, I'm going with the biblical sense and that's, I'm putting my stake in the ground. But the next person I want to introduce really needs no introduction. She is tenacious. She is a fighter. She is a leader. She is a person who has taken the, the chief law enforcement position in the Suffolk County to task and making it go forward. And, uh, you know, I'm so proud of her as in terms of being an, a, a, a black woman, being a Northeastern Law School graduate, uh, knowing a lot of the people that I, that I know. She's the first African-American ever to serve as Massachusetts District Attorney. She is the chief law enforcement official for Boston, Chelsea, Revere, Winthrop, and oversees an office of approximately 300 people handling approximately 35,000 new cases each year. That is our dynamic, uh, vivacious, tenacious Suffolk County District Attorney, Rachel Rollins. Thank Madam you District so much. Attorney. I appreciate it. I'm honored to be here with all of these bold leaders demanding the change our communities and many in this country want, need, and deserve. I spend a lot of time talking about change, the need for change, the urgency of change, the possibility of change. But let's not be fooled. Change like power is never given. It's demanded. And if that doesn't work, it's taken. This requires us to fight for more, to refuse to settle for less. And I know that the fight is daunting. I know we are tired, but we cannot let up. Delay is victory for the status quo. Indecisions and demands for patience are exactly what the three Ps want. Police unions, Proud Boys, and President Trump. And it is what they are hoping for. See, they think they fooled the country into caring more about the property that was damaged in the aftermath of a brutal lynching more than we care about the body and the spirit and the life and the dreams of the person executed, murdered, or lynched. Those damaged buildings and cars and broken windows and stolen merchandise, all of those items can be replaced. Each of those companies likely had insurance for those damaged goods. That is a temporary hardship. What is our insurance as black people? What is our insurance as Latinx people? What is our insurance as poor people? What is our insurance as members of the LGBTQIA plus community? Over 30 black trans women murdered this year alone. See, we don't get the benefit of arrests when we are crime victims, and it is even less likely to happen when the person responsible for our harm or death is a member of law enforcement. 
and adding insult to injury with no remedy in the criminal legal system, we are often precluded from pursuing a civil remedy against law enforcement, including district attorneys, not just the police, due to qualified immunity. Lack of oversight and lack of prosecution by the DA in all of these officer-involved shootings and killings enables the criminal behavior. Remember, in Ahmad Arbery's murder and his lynching, three DAs in Georgia watched that video and said no crime was committed. See, Georgia has a citizen's arrest statute, and they watched that video and believed that the McMichaels, that father and son, were well within their rights. Stand your ground, the Castle Doctrine, citizens' arrests, and the Second, Second Amendment, I have news for you. They do not only apply to white people. They apply to us, too. Remember, we pay taxes for the police departments that over-police us and harm us at disproportionate rates. We pay taxes for the DAs that over-prosecute us. We pay tax dollars, our tax dollars, pay for the judges in the court systems that sentence us disproportionately. Our tax dollars pay for the probation and the carceral system that violates us at higher rates and fails to give us training, treatment, and care when we are in their custody. We pay into Social Security and have a significantly shorter life expectancy than our white counterparts. And for too long, we have been discarded, black bodies, and in doing so, we have traumatized living black souls. Walter Wallace Jr., Elijah McLean, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. The list of names is thousands long and centuries old. Black lives not just lost, but stolen, ripped from us. I am tired, but I am not defeated. I have personally been impacted by sexism and racism and disparities. And every time we see another murder, execution, violent encounter, maiming, we suffer from vicarious trauma. So we must take care of ourselves, especially in this moment. Think of all the ways we have been harmed, damaged, used, murdered, robbed, and appropriated, and still we rise. I have said before, as black people, we are the most culturally appropriated people on the planet, and we are also the only people that get blamed for our murder. Everyone wants to be black until it's time to be black. Well, I, for one, will no longer sit silently and allow people to suck our very essence, take every ounce of good and pure and exceptional from us without paying the steep price and without standing as allies with us, or as I now demand, unindicted co-conspirators in this struggle. How do we demand this? We take it, we run, and we vote. We are more than our oppression, we are more than our resilience. We must celebrate black joy, black success, black innovation. We are entrepreneurs and elite athletes, academics and Grammy award-winning artists, scientists and Pulitzer Prize winners, district attorneys, Congress members, and presidents of city councils activists and advocates, community organizers and committee chairs. We are creating the change we want to see. Change has many battlegrounds, but one that is undeniable, one that is critical to this movement is the ballot box. If you want change, vote. You care about police brutality, vote. You don't want children in cages and families torn apart at our border, vote. You care about making a living wage, vote. You care about surviving this pandemic, you need to vote. If you care about the rights and dignity of our LGBTQIA plus family, vote. Care about who your DA, sheriff, a judge, state rep, state senator, or congresswoman is in Massachusetts, you vote. Who's on your US Supreme Court, you vote. And then you call all your family and friends in states with a Senate seat that can be flipped, and you call and you demand that they vote. Basically, guys, if we care about the future of our country, we must vote. And when we vote, that hope for a better tomorrow becomes the change we need today. Remember, as black people, we help build this country. Our blood is in its soil. Vote like this is your birthright. And like your, like your life depends on it, because it does. Thank you so much. Vote, 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 vote. Mm. Hey, so listen. Thank you to our district attorney. We're so proud of you, and thank you for your hard work. 
everybody who's on this call tonight, start putting into the chat the organizations you represent. Please put them in there so we can see who all is here tonight as part of this 1619 project. Start filling up that chat with the, those organizations. And now it's my honor to present to you um, our city council president, Kim Janey, the first woman to represent District 7, which includes Roxbury, Roxbury. in parts of the South End, Dolchester and Fenway. She's a tireless advocate and a voice for Boston's children. And for more than 20 years, she's been doing that. She's been all over the work in advocating for our children. Let me just get out the way. Come on, President Janey. Get us all hyped up for tomorrow. Thank you for being here tonight. So Thank glad you. to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Motley. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to, to everyone on this call. Certainly want to thank those who had to leave already. Uh, folks from the national office, it's quite an honor to be here with the national folks as well as our local leaders. Certainly want to shout out my sisters in service, Congresswoman Presley. I know she had to leave. Uh, D.A. Rollins, thank you so much. I, I will be very brief. Um, I, you know, it's all been said. So uh, D.A. summed it up nicely with that nice speech. It's all been said. Uh, we have to vote like our lives depend on it because, quite frankly, they do. And we know this as black folks, that that foot has been on our necks. We've got 400 years of receipts. We have a real opportunity to change, to change the direction of this country. And, and what is at stake? Everything, all of those issues that our DA just laid out, that's on the line here. Everything is at stake from a woman's right to choose what to do with her own body uh, to living safely in your own community. We have a wealth gap here in Boston that we know is a quarter of a million dollars. All of those things happen because of policies that were created. And oftentimes those policies were created by people who look like none of us on this Zoom. And they've had dire consequences for us on this Zoom. So how we get out of this is through policy by electing people who have a deep understanding, have some lived experience around some of the real challenges facing our folks and we get them in office. So I'm grateful for everyone who is on this call who is going to make sure that we have an election that is safe and secure. I wanna shout out some of our election protection folks. I see my dear friends and sisters in this work, uh, Cheryl and Sophia on this call. Thank you so much. I've been on the front lines with you as an activist and now I, I sit in a seat, an elected seat. Um, but my concerns around democracy continue. I, I'm, I'm deeply concerned. And so we have to make sure that people can get out there and vote um, tomorrow uh, and that those votes count. We know who's going to decide this election. We decide this election, people. We decide it. Black folks, Latinx folks, immigrant, LBGTQIA folks, all of us. Uh, young people in particular, people are out here. And that is who is going to decide this election. We've got to make sure that folks can vote because every single thing uh, impacting our families, our communities, that's on the ballot. And it's not just the presidential race. It's not just the presidential race. We've got to support our local folks from U.S. Senate to Congress to our state reps and state senators. We've got folks on the ballot who are on the front lines who are fighting every single day, and we've got to make sure that they are in office and can continue to do that work. The last thing that I will say is while we are going to win this election, because we have to, we've got no other choice. I can't do another four years. Uh, we have to win this election, but winning the election isn't a magic pill. It doesn't mean that four years of crazy goes away. It doesn't mean um, that suddenly uh, black folks are free in this country. We've got a lot of work to do. So that work continues and it continues because of the organizations who are on the front lines doing this work every single day. So I'm really grateful to the Urban League 
uh, and our local folks here. So Dr. Motley, Joe, I want to again thank you guys for your leadership and your partnership in this work. We've got a lot of work to do. The first step is, yes, we win this election tomorrow, uh, but then we got to continue to roll up our sleeves and do the work. So thank you guys. Thank you for everyone who is watching. Thank you for all the volunteers. Thank you to everyone who is making phone calls, everyone who's knocking on doors, everyone who's putting up signs, everyone who's doing their part. We've got to do this. We've got to win this. And together we win. Together we win. Together. So thank you. So we have about, first of all, thank you to our city council president. We have about 80 organizations. I said 50. I apologize online right now with us. And we got to make sure you get these 1619 Project shirts, long sleeve and short sleeve, right at that um, at the Urban League and get you out there. And they'll be, on, they'll be available online and everything else. That was a sales pitch. Before I get to the two incredible individuals, you know, when you are trying to do something, you can fake it till you make it. But in this business, you got to go out and get the pros. And so what we decided was we needed lots of help. So where do you get that when it's time to think about anything that has to do with the vote? You go out and you find Cheryl Clyburn Crawford. And you say, listen, remember when you said it's an eye for an eye? Now, she's the executive director of Mass Vote, but more than that, she is also second vice president of the NAACP, Boston Brandt. She's the former executive board chair of Emerge Massachusetts. She sits on the Women Pipeline for Change, Oversight, and Planning the Board. She just does it all. Most importantly, she constantly reminds us that the vote, and when I'm engaged with you, it's a nonpartisan thing, but I'm going to get my people out to do whatever it is they need to do, but they need to vote. And so, Cheryl, thank you for guiding us, for making sure that we had this together, and we're so grateful for your presence here tonight. And thank you. We're looking forward to tomorrow. And we're looking forward to because of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all, everybody that's already spoken so eloquently before me. But I want to say good evening, 1619 Freedom Fighters. Right? Like this is absolutely the moment that we have been preparing for. I'm telling you, I'm geeked. I'm excited. We have a team of people. That's right. That's right. We have a team of people out on the ground right now preparing for you. We're doing electioneering, right? Like we're getting the polls ready. We're putting out the election protection signs and we're just getting it together so that we can do what we've been preparing to do. It has been my absolute pleasure to work alongside you in preparation for this incredible, incredible endeavor. And guess what? You did it. We got those volunteers, and we're getting ready to make it happen. We're going to be poll watching and making sure that everything goes smoothly. I am so looking forward to tomorrow. But more importantly, I'm looking forward to what comes next. This is just the beginning of what I hope is a very long relationship. You know, we worked really hard this year to put this bill in place that would give you so many more options to voting, um, to expanding those options. I'm, I'm inspired by the numbers. 2.3 million people in Massachusetts have already voted either by mail or early voting. We're expecting 1.3 million people tomorrow because everybody keeps saying, do you really think people are going to come out tomorrow? Absolutely. People are going to come out tomorrow because we have those folks that wouldn't vote on any other day except for the first Tuesday in November. So, And we've prepared for them as well. So I just want to say, be prepared. You know, we're talking, spring, you know, preaching to the choir. I know you know these things, but I want to say, make sure that you're in line 
and you're there late, tell people do not get out of line. If they're having any kind of issue, make sure they connect with the person that's at the pole that's wearing one of those fabulous shirts that Sophia Hall's wearing, one of those election protection, or you call 1-866-OUR-VOTE yourself. And the last thing I want to say is just remember, people, if your vote did not count, why would they try so hard to keep you from voting? Thank you. And go get them. Let's vote, vote, vote. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much there, Cheryl Clyburn Crawford. Yeah. Uh, your, your exuberance, and I've watched you over the many, many years in terms of this is not new for you. You've been doing this for such a long period of time and have been so engaged and have been so effective. So I'm looking for uh, an excellent turnout tomorrow with the ground game that both you and Sophia are doing. I want to thank our DA Rollins again. Uh, she was as fiery as I said she would be uh, for sure. I want to thank our city council president for her comments. But as Dr. Motley said, we're coming to the folks who are going to be on the ground doing it. And the next person I'm going to introduce is Sophia Hall. I Near and dear to me is the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, having served on the national as well as on the local Lawyers Committee, have seen the work that the Lawyers Committee has done in so many different ways, fighting the good fight for our community, whether it was a matter of police issues way back in the 1980s, to housing issues, to uh, employment issues, they have covered the gambit. So I'm so proud of the Lawyers Committee. But more importantly, let me talk about the individuals here on the panel with us tonight, because she brings the glue that's going to make this happen. She's going to be on the ground game. She is going to be the lawyer of lawyers if issues do arise which are untoward uh, and inappropriate as far as any type of election suppression tomorrow. Sophia Hall is an experienced litigator, handles a broad range of civil rights matters. She is brilliant. She's a fighter. She knows the ground game. She's out in the forefront. She represents people of color and immigrant women to protect their rights in the workplace. As I talked about, that is the hallmark of the Lawyers Committee. She's handled, uh, filed a landmark sexual harassment lawsuit against a prominent national restaurant chain. I don't have to say how great she is and how brilliant she is. I'll let Boston say that because they said she's one of the top 25 most influential millennials of color. Greater Boston's 50 most influential attorneys of color. So I don't have to say it. It is what it is. Sophia Hall set us straight on what the pl game plan is for tomorrow in terms of protecting the votes of the citizens here in Boston, uh, Brockton, and in Randolph. Sophia Hall. Joe, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, let me just say, I love tag teaming with my sister Cheryl Crawford because, <laughs> you know, she is your cheerleader, but I am your pit bull, right? So I am your muscle. I am the person that's going to ensure that you have all the legal backup you need to be extremely successful, not for yourself, but for every eligible voter in the Commonwealth tomorrow when they go and cast their ballots. It really just, it, it makes my heart sore to be in concert with all of you, with so many of my brothers and sisters who are just trying to make sure that people's rights, the right that we fought, that we sweat, that we died to have, exists for all of us. And I know for those of you who have been participating in these trainings, you are probably tired of hearing it said, but I will say it again anyway, is I fundamentally believe that voting needs to be as easy as breathing. And it's not. It's not anywhere across this country, and it's not right here in our own backyard in Massachusetts. And that is why all of you are so important tomorrow, because by filling those information gaps, by empowering people with their rights, with the law, the law that you know may give us rights, but that have not always allowed us to use those rights, right? There's a difference between having the right to vote, which has existed since they ratified the 15th Amendment in 1870, but oh, there's a right to vote for women since 1920. But we know that access to the ballot box did not come when the law changed, when the law allowed that right. So we have to merge lived experience 
We have to merge what the law gives us with what we take and what we share with our brothers and sisters tomorrow by sharing with them their rights to make sure that every single one of us is heard, to make sure that every single one of us gets to engage in the crown jewel of civil rights, right? The ability to engage in the democratic process. I stand in concert with all of you. I stand in solidarity with all of you. I'm excited that my Massachusetts family has grown by 400 people. And I look forward tomorrow to a long day, but a good day. And if we are lucky, if everything goes really well tomorrow, then it will be a boring day. And I pray for that. I pray for you to be bored because it means that nobody's rights are being violated, that everybody has access, equal access to the ballot box as they should. But in the event that it is not born, in the event that we do not have a dull day, then we are there all day from 6.30 in the morning until 8.30 at night to make sure every single voter who needs that help has it. If for some reason you are participating in our program and you have not yet received your assignment or you have any questions, please email me directly at S-H-A-L-L, S-Hall, at lawyersforcivilrights.org. We will get you set up and we will make sure that you can go and protect your brothers and sisters tomorrow at the polls, on the ground, on the hotline, or at social media platforms. Thank you so much for your time. Told you all, I told you all that we're prepared. We're prepared. And so I know um, you, you've been seeing Henry Thomas sitting over there in the screen all night as one of our very special inside the panel guests. Henry, uh, is there anything that you want to share with us very quickly before I turn it over to William to get us ready for tomorrow? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to say is that I am inspired. Uh, I am impressed. And I'm fired up. Mm. The, the commitment, the level of commitment and intensity among you as leaders is... Uh, something to behold. Um, if I can borrow from Frederick Douglass, uh, you have created, uh, you have, you've created a, a capacity coming out of this pandemic and this election. And Frederick Douglass uh, said, and I know you guys are familiar with this, is that power concedes nothing without a demand. Mm. It never has, and it never will. And and what I would like to think is that this energy and the intellectual uh, aggressiveness that we heard this evening is really setting a case to soften the battlefield soften the battlefield, understanding that there's a lot more work to be done. But the work that has been done up to this particular point is good. And but we're going to take good and transition into great. And mm -hmm. I think that we can do it with the kind of talent. And I'm, uh, I commend all of you for your uh, commitment and for your zeal. Well, we appreciate you, and I know you got it all going down there in Western Massachusetts for tomorrow as well. We just wanted you to come on board to balance out the state a little bit for us today. So now I'm going to get to this freedom fighter, uh, this young man who this young man who has been bugging me and bugging me and bugging me about this idea um, all year about how we needed to get out of here and get out the vote. Um, and be a part, and more importantly, gather organizations to help us do that as a community. And so um, not only has the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts staff been engaged, but our lead organizer for the 1619 Project has been William Watkins. Now, he sort of daylights as our director of work, workforce development, and he sort of moonlights as a rabble rouser, um, I got to get out here, Dr. Motley. I got to let these folk know what time it is. I got to keep on fighting for this freedom. Now, he's a former legislative aide to the great late congressman and civil rights 
activist John Conyers. That's where he got a lot of that from. But he got a lot of that also when he was running around as a youngster here in this town, being mentored by many people that are on this um, call tonight. And so we're so proud. And so William, we want you to sort of give us direction for tomorrow to sort of, I know there's been over nine, there's been over a hundred organizations that have been in the chat uh, tonight. And so I know we don't, we can't go through all of them, but tell us what we need to be about tomorrow. And if there's any other directions that we need uh, as we go through tonight. And thank you for all of your hard work on this. Well, thank you, Dr. Motley, uh, Chairman Feaster, uh, Brother President Henry Thomas, D.A. Rollins, my, my two sisters in arms, Paul and Clyde Byrne. Um, this has been awesome. Tonight has been awesome. I hope everyone is inspired by the words. We, we done heard the drum beat. We got our marching orders. Um, and I just want to put out a couple of things before I close with this. Um, make sure you have the election protection voter hotline from the Suffolk County DA's office, 617-619-HELP. 617-619-HELP. Make sure you have that uh, handy and available. And also make sure you have 866 our vote 866 our vote the over 50 or so organizations that have come together for this 1619 project uh hey i, I can't name them all so i'm not going to do that but i i thank you i thank all of the volunteers who have stepped up to this this awesome task to be a part of history but as i was thinking about what i was going to say tonight I went to the movie Glory, and and there's that scene at the towards the end when Morgan Freeman was talking to the men the day before the battle, and he, he had said a prayer as they were singing, "Oh my Lord, 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 Lord." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that oh, my Lord. powerful and, and I want to leave it with you all because this is the day before going into battle and it's going to be a long day tomorrow some people are going to say we, we're not going to be able to count the votes but we're going to be able to count them we're going to be able to count them so he said this, Lord, we stand before you this evening to say thank you. Mm. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your many blessings. Now, I run off and left all my youngins and my kinfolk in bondage. And as we think about this, I want you to think about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and all of those names that we've lost through COVID. Okay, Henry. So I stand here this evening, Heavenly Father, to ask your blessing on all of us so that if tomorrow is our great getting up morning, if tomorrow we have to meet the judgment day, our Heavenly Father, we want you to let our folks know that we died facing the enemy. Mm. We want them to know that we went down standing up amongst those that are fighting against our oppression. We want them to know, Heavenly Father, that we died for freedom. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want that to be left with you this evening. And I'll see you bright and early in the morning as we make sure everyone's rights are protected. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So, all right, Freedom Fighters, we got some work to do. We're going to all be up early. Um, you know, I'm going to be riding around in that car, looking, checking it out myself with my beautiful bride by my side. And listen, we're just so proud and we're honored 
that you spent this time with us tonight, but also that you're going to give your time tomorrow. Look forward to it. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to all the panelists that joined us. Let's have a great day tomorrow. Peace. All right. Good.